Peter starts the first three verses, uh, or the first six verses, I'm sorry, talking about women and, and, uh, and specifically wives and, uh, and how they uh, relate in their role within their marriage. And now um, Peter only has one verse to say to the men, but it does not mean that men have less to work on uh, because there's a whole bunch of other scriptures all throughout the Bible that deal with the men. Uh, and in particular, um, a lot of uh, commentators mention too that uh, uh, in particular, some of the other um, elements that Peter talks about, uh, like being um, uh, servants and workers and stuff like that, uh, a lot of that stuff deals with the men's hearts anyhow. So, uh, but, uh, but as we look at this verse, uh, we're gonna kind of jump off from this verse and uh, probably uh, dig a little bit deeper and a little bit broader to see what uh, God would really desire for us uh, as men. But uh, the, the women here, don't worry, you're not gonna be uh, just you know, bored listening to this. Uh, so many of the principles that are for the men tonight are also for us because one thing we're gonna be looking at in particular isn't as much uh, what our role as, uh, as men, uh, what that role is, uh, but really what the, the role of, of every Christian person is, uh, the main goal of every believer. Uh, so, and we'll get into some spe specifics with the men, uh, but it's gonna be something that'll be applicable to every single one of us. So, uh, so let's pray, and then uh, we'll jump into it. Father, as I, uh, as I spent this, this uh, week just in your word and thinking through uh, the, the men that are uh, in my life, uh, the older men, the men that are my age, the younger men, my own boys. And I started thinking through what it is that you desire for us, what it is that you've shown us in your word that is uh, your, your will and your desire and your design for us. God, it becomes a very convicting thing for me as your word shows me the many areas of my life that I fall short and that you're still working in me and sanctifying me in. But God, more than anything, it, uh, it, it just it causes my heart just to, to enlarge in because I, I see even the specific faces of different men in this church here and the men in my life that are not in this church, friends and family, relatives, and God, my, my heart just, uh, it, it enlarges for them because I know firsthand what it's like to be a, a sinful man, a Christian man, a, a dad, a husband, trying just to, to, to do your will and to know what you've called me to do and, and that can be a very frustrating place as well as a, an exciting place and, and I, I believe God that so many of us are caught in that frustrating place and when we get frustrated we do stupid things and God we your people we don't want to do stupid things we want to live a life that glorifies you a life that brings you honor. And so God, I, I pray that tonight your word would convict us and challenge us. And God, that it would renew us and restore us. So thank you, Lord, for your love for us, your love for the men here, as well as for the women. And we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last night when I was... Uh, meditating more and just, you know, I always kind of just try to put a little more finishing touches on the message. I go through my notes and, and it's always a dangerous thing when I do that because I just keep adding more scripture and I go, oh, this one would be great. No, I love this one. And I just, it, it starts becoming this massive undertaking. But, but as I was going through it last night, uh, I started thinking through uh, just how it started kind of boiling up inside of me. And I remember this scripture in Jeremiah 20 that says that the word of God is like fire uh, in our bones. That when the word of God really goes in us, it just, it starts lighting you on fire. And that's how I was feeling last night, just getting so fired up on the inside. 
And, uh, and I started thinking through uh, the word and how the word affects us. And, and I know that sometimes the word of God is like this precision scalpel that opens us up and it's very delicate and intricate and it just, it's, very, uh, it's just very careful in how it cuts away at things in our life that, aren't, that shouldn't be there. But sometimes the word of God is that, that two-edged sword that just kind of whacks things off and it just cuts things off of our life. And I, and I put on, on, on Facebook last night that I feel like tonight is gonna be one of those nights where the word of God is gonna be like a battle ax. Uh, last week, I was a little more gentle, a little more pastoral with the women, just taking that scalpel and just being very uh, delicate and careful, very caring, but tonight, you men, it's battle ax time. I don't mean that I'm gonna be you know, mean or angry or anything like that, but just that, uh, that it, it's time for us as men to really acknowledge what God has called us to do and start doing war against the sin in our hearts, the disobedience, the, the laziness, the, the, uh, the, how we, we abdicate our role as spiritual leaders. We need to just stop right now. We need to repent, we need to turn. And so and I know that even as I, I prayed, uh, you know, that so many of us, men and women alike, but you men, you get frustrated in your life. You, you know that there's something better and something greater. You know that there's something you're failing in. And, and guys, we just, we're, we're performance-based. And when we don't live up to that performance, we just, we beat ourselves up. I, I, I mean, at least that's how I am. And, and I, and I want to I break that whole thing. And it's not going to just happen tonight. But I hope that, that we take this, this axe, this double-edged sword, and we just slice open what has been holding us back and bringing frustration and just let it be exposed so the Lord and his word can start dealing with us, so the Holy Spirit can start convicting us, and so we can start working on us. But it's gonna take some of this just initial, just go after us, Lord, open us up, tell us where we're going wrong and where we need to be going. I spent the first uh, really probably 11 or 12 years even of my Christian life really kind of self-focused. If I'm gonna be totally honest, I was very concerned with my role in the kingdom of God, my role in the church, my calling, um, how my gifts and my talents can be used, where I fit in the grand scheme of the gospel being uh, put out in this community. I, I spent a lot of time thinking where my gifts and talents fit in and, and, and what my purpose, my purpose in life was. I spent a lot of those years really just frustrated, feeling like I'm spinning my wheels because I just can't figure out where I fit in. And this really, it just, it drove me so much. And I, and I started realizing only just a few years ago that, that I had everything backwards. I was trying to insert God into my story rather than seeing myself being inserted into God's story. I wanted to call the shots and I wanted him to accommodate me. I wanted him to be a means to my end and my glorification and, and how I can affect the world rather than me being a, a means to his end and bringing his own glory into this world. And the fact of the matter is that us as guys, we, uh, we like to be the center. We like things to be about us. And Peter's gonna go straight to the heart of this, even just in this one little verse and, and show us men that this is not how we're supposed to design our life. So I wanna open up to this one verse and then I, I've got a few um, uh, examples and, and, and things that I wanna uh, present to us so, so Peter can really help us see where we're going wrong and amiss in our life and help us to correct our course. So open up to 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Peter here says likewise. Remember that word likewise is important because it points us back to the previous section. The example of Christ, that, that Christ laid down his life for others. So likewise, husbands, just as Christ laid his life down, live with your wives in an understanding way. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now women, don't take offense to that. It doesn't mean that you're weak-minded or anything like that. It just means that typically men physically are built stronger, just physically. 
doesn't mean that women are never physically stronger than men. It doesn't mean it's wrong to be stronger than men. It just means that typically, if you just look at the way our bodies are built, men are typically stronger physically. It's all that it means. There's nothing behind it. So show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. So it's saying that we're to, to, to care for the women. We're to look after the women, be protectors of the women, not abusers of the women. Because... Because they are heirs, and if you read into the Greek, it actually um, more kind of uh, points to the fact that it says that they are co-heirs, like equal heirs. We are equals. We are equally heirs in Christ. So husbands, your wives are your partners. They are equal partners with you. And so you're to be their protector, their leader, because they are your equal and because they are co-heirs with you because they have all the rights and all the inheritance, the same inheritance that you have is theirs. They're your partner. They are heirs with you of the grace of life. But here is the main purpose. The main purpose isn't just to lay your life down for your wife and esteem her as higher than you and all that good stuff. But the main purpose is this, so that your prayers may not be hindered. See guys, here's the thing is that for your even spiritual life to be fruitful, for your ministry, for your calling, for your purpose, whatever word you wanna use, your destiny, it doesn't matter what word. If you want that to be fruitful, the only way for that to happen is if your marriage is your first ministry. Because if it's not, your prayer life will be hindered. You will never have a fruitful ministry. You will never be able to walk in that thing that God has called you to do if you're not bringing honor into your marriage, leading your wife in the way that you should. When you don't do that, your prayer life is hindered, your relationship with God is hindered, you lose your, your marriage, you lose your ministry. You lose your family, you lose the ministry, the calling, all that, that stuff that we tend to put above family and marriage. We, we tend to do that. We, we put the marriage and the family on the altar because we want this thing that gives us the exhilaration that we as guys, we just, we crave it. We, we crave uh, the attaboy. We crave the pat on the back and we crave the purpose and the whole thing and finding identity in anything but Jesus. We'll chase after that thing and our, our, our wives and our families become unnecessary victims of it, of our pursuits chasing after what really is idolatry. We chase after ministry and purpose and calling and fulfillment and identity. And those things become idols, they become gods and we worship them and we put our families on the altar of those gods. And so here Peter's saying, if you want to even have this fulfillment, this, this joy in your life, then you have to have your family and your spouse in particular as your first ministry. If you don't, then everything else will be hindered, including your relationship with the Lord himself. I wanna uh, read you a few stats here. Ninety-one percent of all violent crimes are committed by men. Ninety-four percent of DUIs are committed by men. 99% of all family-based crimes are committed by men. See, the, the biggest demographic of crime has nothing to do with race, has nothing to do with age, but it's gender. It doesn't matter what race it is, it doesn't matter how old they are, the fact of the matter is that over 90% of all violent crimes and family crimes are men regardless of the color of their skin. The problem is men. I know there's some laughter, but it's true, isn't it? And the thing is, is that we have this desire. I mean, you think of those crimes, violent crime and crimes against family. Men, we are self-centered people. We don't want to take responsibility for what we've been given. Think about Adam in the garden. Three out of the four people that were there, he blamed them for the problem. He blamed the woman, he blamed the serpent, and he blamed God. But he didn't blame himself. We don't want the responsibility. We just want to have fun, and we just want what we want now. That's our problem. 
And so these stats come to fruition. They're, these are real stats. Men, we have a problem. In the US, 1.3 women are raped every minute. That's 78 women per hour in the United States. I know some of you guys are sitting here thinking, okay, I, I get that, but I don't, I'm not a violent crime offender. I, I, I love my family. I love my wife. I'm faithful. But here's, here's some other stats. 48% of 18 to 30 year olds, okay, so adult men, 18 to 30 year olds, play three hours of video games per day. Per day. Adult men, three hours every day. 9.7 million men are living with a girlfriend or a fiance. Haven't committed, but just living with their girlfriend or fiance. $3,000 are spent every second on pornography. Every second, 28,000 views of pornography per second. And I don't have to tell you what the percentage is of how many of those are men or women. In 1970, 85% of US men were married by the age of 30, but now only 58% of men are married by the age of 30. Why is this? It's because men, we don't wanna grow up. We don't want all the responsibility. We just want what we want right now. We want to be the center of our own life and our own universe. And we don't want to grow up. We don't want to take on all these responsibilities and be real men. We want to be grown-up boys. Now, am I saying it, it's wrong to watch some sports throughout the week or play video games? But I'm not saying those things are wrong, but when you're spending so much time and that becomes the focus. When that becomes the thing that you think about and you look forward to every day, there's a problem. Your life is about you. You're self-centered. You, just, you want to be the center of everything in your life. Uh, here's, here's a few uh, quotes from people. Uh, Brad Pitt turned away from his boyhood faith because he says, since God says you have to say that I'm the best, it seems to me that it's all just about his ego. See, and so Brad Pitt has a problem. He goes, I don't want someone else to be the center of my life. C.S. Lewis, before he became a Christian, he complained that God's demand to be praised sounds like a vain woman who wants compliments. So C.S. Lewis, before he was a Christian, he said, I, I'm not, God demands that I praise him? That's, that sounds so vain. I don't wanna praise a God who demands to be praised. Oprah walked away from Orthodox Christianity when she was 27 because of the biblical teaching that God is jealous. He demands that he and no one else gives our highest allegiance and affection. It didn't sound very loving to her. The idea of, of God being jealous and, and desiring and demanding our affection, she goes, that doesn't sound loving. I don't, I'm not gonna make him the center of my life. Eric Reese, the writer of an American gospel, he rejected the Jesus of the gospel because only an egomaniac would demand that we love him more than we love our parents and children. And Michael Prowse, a columnist for the London Financial Times, turned away from his faith because only, quote, tyrants puffed up with pride crave adulation. See, we, we just have this inherent thing where we just, we don't wanna make anything else except for our own interests and desires center. And we, we push back on the idea that God uh, would, would demand our praise. But see, we don't understand that the reason God demands our praise is because God knows that if we make him the center of our life, then we get all the joy, then we get the peace, then we get all the blessings of Christ. See, it doesn't say in Matthew 6, seek first the blessings of God and God will be given to you. It doesn't say in, in Psalm 37, 4, to delight yourself in your own desires and God will be given to you. It says to seek first the kingdom of God, make God central, and if you do, then everything else that you need, not necessarily everything that you want, but everything you need will be given to you. 
And even in the context of Matthew 6, he even goes after the most important things in our life, like the roof over our head, the clothing, and the food that we eat. He says, don't worry about those things. Don't seek after those things. If you seek after them, you miss it all. If you're going to make that God, if you're going to make your decisions based on those things, then those things now are your God. But if you seek after me first and find joy in me first, if you make me the center, I promise you I will give you the joy, the fulfillment, the satisfaction, everything that you want and desire, all those things that are driving you to act sinfully, sinning against other people in your life. All those desires will be satisfied by knowing me because there is nothing like me. There is no love like the love that I can give. If you would just make me the center, I promise you I'm better than all of that. I want what's best for you. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given to you. You'll be so satisfied in Christ that you won't have these sinful desires to fill up your life and fill up your time and fill up your mind with things that are dead. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Your desires will change, I promise you. I'm living proof of that. Delight yourself in the Lord. C.S. Lewis has this great quote. He says, if you aim for heaven, you get earth thrown in. But if you aim for earth, you get neither. You, You miss it. And so for us, for us men, Our task, our goal, is to make the gospel, to make Jesus even more important than the marriage itself. Because if if your whole aim is to have a healthier marriage and a better marriage and a happier marriage and to have the American dream and to live more comfortably and have more money and to, to do all those things, if you just, you know, wish your wife was more of this or that or your kids were more of this or that, if that's your focus, that's your aim, you're gonna be deeply dissatisfied. You're gonna be deeply frustrated. You're gonna make those things into God, into the idol, and you're gonna, you're gonna lose out on all of it. But if you make Christ the center, if you hold, uphold the gospel as the main thing in your life, now your heart's being transformed, your mind's being changed, you're being sanctified and conformed to the image of Christ, and when that starts happening, then your marriage starts getting transformed, then your kids start getting transformed, your wife starts getting transformed because you are being transformed and you're leading them lovingly, graciously, sacrificially, And you're leading them in worship because your heart is so enamored with who Jesus Christ is. So when you make the gospel, you make Christ higher than everything, even the great blessings of God. But you make that the the, the highest part of your life. Everything changes. But that's a battle for us, especially us men. It's a battle for us because we love just to center things around us. We think about ourselves first. That's why it's time for us to do war against these desires, to do war against these these sinful characteristics in our life and in our hearts. Because if we don't, we're gonna start doing war against our families and our wives and our friends. Sin hurts people. Big sin, little sin, medium sin, whatever, it hurts people. And so if we don't make Christ the center and the most important thing in our life, we're gonna just continually hurt people. But if we make Christ the center, then we start drawing people into Christ even more. And you start seeing those lives in your life that you love, you see them change because of what's happening to you. So what does this look like for us in your notes? First of all, it must be intentional. None of us, drift towards holiness. None of us drift towards godliness. You don't drift away from temptation. We have to be intentional. We have to make choices. We have to make decisions. We have to cut things off. We have to say no to things. And we have to ask the Holy Spirit to give us the strength and power to do it. We have to be in the word so the word starts changing us from the inside out and giving us different desires. If we just sit back and expect we're like we're just gonna become awesome husbands and dads, it's not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. We have to be intentional. 
The main task, this is in your notes, the main task of the man is to make God's glory alone the number one priority in firstly, your own life, and then secondly, in your home. It has to start with you, men. Whether you're married or not, you're a dad or not, if you're single, it doesn't matter. You've got to make Christ first in your life now. If you're single, you're not married yet, do it now. Don't start later. Do it now. Secondly, we must have integrity. Uh, open up to Titus chapter one, verse five. This is, uh, this is specifically uh, for uh, overseers of the church, elders. But the thing about, this, uh, about elders and the requirements for elders and pastors is this, is that uh, it's not just elders that are required to be these things that I'm about to read off. We're all called to this standard. It's just that you cannot be a pastor or an elder if you don't. So you can, you can be a Christian and struggle in this area and, and all that kind of stuff and have uh, even some of these things totally out of whack in your life. And you're still a believer. But all of us are called to this, this list here. But for me and for other pastors and elders, uh, we, we have to live by this or else we get disqualified and we can't operate uh, at, in what we do. Okay, but the, the thing is, is that all of us are called to this list. So uh, in Titus 1, I go to verse six. If anyone, speaking of men here that are being called in, as to be elders, but, uh, but if anyone is above reproach, which means that there's nothing that's majorly negative that you can say about their life. If he's the husband of one wife, he's got eyes only for his wife. He's not living in, in pornography and he's not, uh, you know, he's not having uh, affairs and things like that. Husband of one wife and his children are believers and he's not open to the, ch and, and the children are not open to the charge of, of debauchery or partying or insubordination. An overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant. So men, that arrogance thing, it's really, really easy for us. Remember we, we talked last week about Genesis 3 and how uh, we, by our, our, our sin nature, we have this, this natural, uh, uh, this desire to rule over our wives wrongfully. We have this very natural disposition to be arrogant. It must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. Shouldn't be a drunk. It's, it's disgraceful. When I, I see or I hear about people who say, hey, I'm a believer, I love Jesus, and they're drunks. They, they, they lack self-control. They're not being led by the Holy Spirit, but they're being led by something else. Now, I'm not saying it's, not, it's wrong to have a glass of wine or a beer. I do, but, uh, but getting drunk, going to that place where this thing is controlling you, making you look stupid, making a fool out of Christ, really. Violent or greedy for gain and money, pining for the new stuff pining for the upgrade in life, doing whatever it takes to get that new shiny object. You know, you, 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 you go hang out with someone who has better stuff, whatever, and you leave wanting more. That thing that's in us, we just, we put so much stock in stuff that's just gonna burn. And we find identity in it and we find joy and completion and fulfillment. And it's just, it, it's not, again, it's not bad to have nice stuff. You have nice stuff, that's great, that's awesome, praise God. But when you start desiring it and it starts controlling how you feel about your own life, that's when it's a problem. But instead, instead, the flip side of all this, we should be hospitable, a lover of what's good, self-controlled upright, holy, and disciplined. And men, we should hold firm to the trustworthy word of God which was taught so that we can be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. Men, the most important thing about you is what you believe about God. Your doctrine, your theology matters. It is important. You need to lead your family with your understanding of God's word and who he is. You need to lead your own heart and your own life and your own mind. If you have a, a faulty understanding of who God is and what the word of God says, you're gonna have a really hard time even putting off all of these sinful traits. 
going to have a hard time leading your family, leading your wife, if you don't understand God's character and nature and his grace and the gospel and who Jesus is. You need to be students of the word of God. It's not just for pastors or people that lead Bible studies or community groups or whatever it is. This is for all of us men. We need to know the word of God. We need to know our Father. We need to know our Savior. And he's revealed himself here. Be diligent in it. You should be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. You shouldn't put up with garbage theology. Uh, there's a verse that says that uh, bad company corrupts uh, good uh, character, corrupts good habits. It's the same thing with theology. Bad theology will corrupt you. Uh, bad theology, I've seen it, um, corrupts so many people that are otherwise good, Jesus-loving people. And, and when they don't understand who God really is and they have weird beliefs uh, based on who knows what, they read it on the internet or somewhere, or it's on Wikipedia or whatever, they saw it on Facebook and all of a sudden it's their belief, it's their theology and because they're, they're, they have this self-centered theology that really uh, it caters to them rather than adapting themselves to the word of God, they adapt the word of God to themselves, uh, that ruins us. We have to be students of the word. We have to know the word so that we can shepherd our own hearts so that then we can shepherd our family's hearts. We must be students of the word. We have to be humbly sacrificial. Ephesians 5.22, I always read this one at, at weddings when I do them, uh, because whenever I, I read through the first part of this Ephesians chapter, um, it talks about the women submitting to their husbands, and, and I always see the look on the guy's face, they're like, yeah, you hear that? You hear what he's saying there? You need to submit to me, you know, all the days of our marriage. And then it turns, though, and it says, okay, I, I just say, okay, but you guys, here's the thing, you're called to a much more difficult calling. Because the very next sentence after that, it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did Christ love the church? How did he show his love for the church? He died for us. He laid his life down for us. Husbands, you're called to do the same. You don't demand submission. You don't demand that your wife respect you, especially when you don't deserve it, but you're called to lay your life down for your wife because Christ laid his life down for you. And you lay your life down for her gladly, willfully, and joyfully because Christ did the same for you. It's a joy to serve your wife and your family. It's an honor to do so, because in doing so, you're reflecting the image of Jesus Christ, and you're being conformed more and more into his image as you do that. You start putting away all those selfish desires and motivations, that proclivity to, to make uh, your life centered around you, and now you're making your life centered firstly around Jesus Christ and the gospel, and because that happens, then the therefore is that therefore, I do the same for other people. I lay my life down for them because Christ did it for me, therefore I do it for them. It becomes a joy. We must, men, we must be tough and tender. We have to have soft hearts but thick skin. Not taking offense and getting defensive at things. Having a soft heart but having thick skin. In Colossians 3.18 it says, Wives, submit to your husbands because it's fitting in the Lord, but husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. Don't be harsh with them. But rather, what we should be harsh with is our own sin. Our own faults, our own character flaws. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, after Paul gives instruction to Timothy to, to pour into younger men and teach them to be real godly men, to be real actual men. He says, then therefore, as you pour into those men, that we all were to share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, because no soldier gets entang uh, entangled in civilian pursuits, because his aim is to please the one that enlisted him. See, we, we pour into each other, we pour into the, the, the younger men because we wanna teach them how to be real men of God. 
We don't want them to be uh, taken uh, out into civilian pursuits, but we are going to be about our Father's business. We are at war as the church. There is sin that is creeping after us. The word says that that the enemy is this, this lion that is ready to devour us. And we need to train each other so that we can be at war and not get caught up in pursuing all the other peripheral things, pursuing our desires and all the, even the blessings of God. We get so content pursuing the blessings of God and these civilian pursuits that we miss out on aiming to satisfy the one who enlisted us in the first place. Jesus Christ has bought us with a price We should not be content chasing after anything in life other than him. He paid dearly for our life. And our reward is great. We we have this inheritance and we are co-heirs with our spouse. And we need to mind ourselves as soldiers enlisted by our father in a battle, doing war against our sin, war against these character flaws. John Owen, the great... uh, uh, He was a a Puritan pastor in the 1600s. He says this, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. If you're not actively killing your sin and being intentional on going after your sin, your sin's gonna get you. It's gonna sideline you. It's gonna take you out. It's gonna distract you into civilian pursuits. You'll take yourself out of the battle and with that, then there goes also your marriage and your family. They become needless casualties of war. We've got to be killing our sin and actively going after our sin. So how can we grow in all of this as men? There's, I mean, I feel like I just opened up this big can of worms and, and there's just so much more we could talk about. But uh, first and foremost, guys, you, you have to have men in your life that you uh, can be honest with. You have to be willing to tell someone all the stuff that you deal with. And you have to remember that the stuff you deal with is not unique. Uh, We as men, we've been going through the same problems for thousands of years. Okay, that's why we're here together because we're here because we admit that we're all sinful people and we need the word of God. We need the Holy Spirit. We need Jesus to change us, okay? So, So that part is out in the open, right? We can agree to that. We all have problems, yeah? Okay, so we need to reach out to each other. You cannot do this alone. Uh, Anyone who's been enlisted in the military knows that you cannot fight a war on your own. You never go out alone. You're always uh, always with someone else. It's just, we have to stay together. Uh, Here at our church, we have community groups. It's the, the best way for you to start getting involved with other people's lives. Start finding those relationships. You know, you might not uh, unveil all the dirty, dark secrets in your community group, but you start making friends and you start trusting uh, another guy in the group that you really start connecting with and you, you start, you hang out, you go out to coffee, whatever it might be, and you can start really opening up and saying, this is what I'm struggling with. I need help. Can you help me? I, I do this thing uh, with some of my friends and I do it with my, my, my boys. We call them fight clubs because we get together and we fight for the gospel in our lives. We don't fight each other. We don't beat each other up. We don't tell each other how sinful we are. But we fight for the gospel to be central in our life. And I do this with my boys regularly. And they they just love it. They always ask, when do we get to our next fight club? For them, a lot of it has to do because we get like the, we get like the, the blended like coffee drink things, you know, they just they love those. But but it's it's just amazing because I get to sit with my boys and we just talk about Jesus. We talk about sin and we talk about how Jesus can change us. You need those men to fight with you. You need those people in your life. Uh, I also, I I recommended a couple of books here, but I mean, there's seriously so many great books that could help, but um, but here's a couple in particular. But lastly, the most important thing is you need to learn how to repent. And I don't just mean confession of sin, but I mean how to really turn towards Jesus and run towards Jesus, run towards his grace, run towards his truth, run towards the cross. You need to stop living in that place of guilt and condemnation and worthlessness and all that stuff. You have to start believing 
who you are in Christ. Because the fact of the matter is this, yes, you've failed tremendously countless times in your life, but the blood of Christ has covered all of that. There is no sin that is so deep that God's grace can't cover it, that his forgiveness doesn't cover it. You have redemption. You, you have this imperishable inheritance that Christ has for you. And when you start believing the truth of who you are and what God has called you to do and how he sees you now, your, your, your life will start changing. But it has to start first with just us being honest and repenting and saying, God, thank you so much that you forgive me. Thank you. I know I've failed tremendously and I, I fail daily, but I know you forgive me and I wanna, I wanna give up all my sinfulness and I wanna receive your forgiveness, your grace. We've got to start being humble. So as we close, I, uh, I just, I wanna, I wanna pray that that you men especially, I, I know that tonight it was, uh, you know, it's a little cutting, it's a little harsh, but you have to know that all of this, that the end story for us tonight isn't just to beat ourselves up and to, and to just open up the wounds, open up the, the body to, and, and just leave us on the operating table. But we close tonight reminding ourselves that Christ is here to change us, to transform us, to heal us, that he's willing to do it that he's given you the Holy Spirit as your helper to do it. He's given you the word of God as your guide to do it. You don't have to do this in your own strength and by your own ability. Matter of fact, you can't. You'll try because you're a dude, but you can't. Okay, we, we've got to start humbling ourselves, reaching out to each other, and most importantly, standing on the word of God, trusting in the Holy Spirit, believing in God's grace, making the gospel central in our life. And I know that tonight we're not gonna solve all of our problems. I know that tonight you're not gonna go home and have a brand new awesome habit in the word of God and believing all the truths, but just if you guys are just willing to journey with me through this, to press forward into next week and the week after and the day after that and the month after that, I promise you guys we're gonna be transformed. I promise you guys your life is gonna change. It's not gonna just happen tonight. But I hope tonight we just we open ourselves up and we let that scalpel go in and we say, God, in the coming days and weeks and months and years, I know you're gonna change me. Sometimes big change, sometimes little subtle change. But we're here and we say, God, you can do it. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, uh, I, I know that this is such a huge, huge topic. And it's so difficult even just to, to close after, you know, 40 minutes and just, uh, uh, you know, saying peace be with you, go in peace. And, and uh, because I know that this is a lifelong transformation. And it's a daily transformation. It's even an hourly transformation, God. And, and I don't want us as men to get frustrated more and more with ourselves. But I want us tonight to rejoice in the fact that we have hope because of what your son did for us on the cross. That though we've failed in all these areas, he never failed once in them. And he gladly and joyfully gave up his life for us. That we can now live in faith knowing that we have his identity that when you see us, you don't see us as the faithless men that we really are, but you see us as your faithful son. Because your son took on our sin on the cross and he traded with us, he gave us his own righteousness. And God, believing that just gives me a different confidence that I know I can walk in your presence, Lord, upright, with joy and peace and satisfaction. I find fulfillment in my life when I live in that place. So God, I, I wanna pray specifically, Lord, for the men that, uh, that condemnation and shame and, and fear 
and that, that desire to abdicate their role and their, uh, in, their, in their leadership and in guiding their family, their spouse, or if they're single, uh, they abdicate their, their role in even being a, a witness to their friends and to their families. God, I pray that all of that, that, that shame and that, that dissatisfaction, that frustration that they are feeling in their life, God, will be replaced by the fruit of the Spirit, God, that they would have a desire to press more into you so they can find true satisfaction, not in what they do for you, but they would find it in you alone. Because God, this life isn't about doing stuff for you, this life is about what you've done for us. And so God, help us to live in that place to find ultimate joy in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us so deeply that you laid your life down for us. Encourage specifically the men here tonight. Fill them with joy that they've been forgiven in Christ, that you love them, that you desire them, and that you will build them. You will change them. I love that you've promised us that. you, Lord. In Jesus' name.